for our main presentation. We have a speaker very well known uh, to the club. He's been around for a long time. Jim Shedlowski graduated from the University of Michigan in, 19, hey. Hey. in 1960. Wow. That was before the... That's when they only had dirt roads, right? <laughs> Minus wine there was. Right. He um, then, then served as an officer in the U.S. Army, I think in Germany. Um, worked for a GM for a long career. Retired from that. Uh, served as a, a treasurer of this organization uh, and along the way he's both written music and performed music. Maybe we'll hear some tonight. Uh, sure well, there's a guitar right there. He has a new album out on Dharma Records. <laughs> Seriously. I have several copies too. <laughs> he and his wife spend the winters in Mesa, Arizona. <coughs> where they have some really nice skies for observing. Uh, tonight, his topic is Stellafane, Shrine to the, sky, to the Stars, and he asks that we hold questions till the end of his presentation. You're on, man. Uh, I have a question. Has anyone in the room here been to Stellafane. Okay, we got one here and, and two. Good. And three. And three, right? <laughs> and uh, my cohort was going to be here tonight, Tom Hagen, who I'll mention in the presentation. But Tom, and Tom and I were there for you. <laughs> Good evening, and ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to my presentation tonight about a subject an amateur astronomy phenomena, which has intrigued me for many years, and perhaps has sparked an interest in some of you, Stellafane. When I joined the Warren Astronomical Society some 13 years ago, <clears throat> shortly after my retirement, I was struck by the rich diversity of the club membership. I was surprised to find individuals from all walks of life. Doctors, barbers, mechanics, lawyers, engineers, scientists, artists, teachers, and even financial advisors. Oh, oh. They were male and female, conservative and liberal, young and old, from a variety of social strata and religious persuasion, but all had a common interest, a common curiosity about what's out there, and an interest in learning more about it. This movement of everyday folks, amateurs, learning more about astronomy really began in 1920 when Russell Porter, of whom we will hear much more later, organized a small group of interested workers from a machine tool factory in Springfield, Vermont, to build their own poor man's telescope. As we shall see, this led to the formation of a small club several years later, which in turn spawned the first celebration Stellafane Convention in 1926 with an invitation to all parties interested in the heavens. My presentation tonight will tell the story about Stellafane, its history and what it's all about, and why some of you might be interested in visiting this, the granddaddy of amateur astronomy. My personal exposure to Stellafane came two years ago. I had heard bits and pieces about Stellafane for years, and was quite curious about the snippets from Sky and Tell, Astronomy Magazine, and other sources regarding this gathering. So it was with surprise and pleasure that I was asked to participate in a day-long workshop that is now held in conjunction with the annual Stellafane Convention. The 2013 workshop was about solar astronomy, and I was honored to give a presentation entitled the mcmath Hulbert Observatory, then and now, which I had prepared and given to this august body in this very room in September of 2012. Some of you may remember. 
On August 8th of 2013, Tom Hagen from the Math Hulbert Observatory Group, whom many of you know, Tom and I traveled to Springfield to deliver our talk and we were pleased to spend the next several days taking in the convention and visiting the various venues involved with some very friendly and hospitable hosts. I have long wondered about the name Stella Fink. Was it a place, an event, an idea, or what was it? I was to find out that it was all of these. The name derives from the Latin stellar thing, meaning shrine to the stars, suggested by Russell Porter in 1924 as a name for the newly constructed clubhouse of the newly formed Springfield Telescope Makers, an amateur astronomy club. I'd like to now give you an overview of Stella Payne, the place, the event, and the philosophy, after which we will look into its history and then a more detailed description of the modern Stella Payne. <coughs> Stella Payne, the place, consists of the original 30-acre plot donated by Russell Porter on Breezy Hill near Springfield, Vermont, and is the location of the historic Kent Clubhouse and the Porter Turret Telescope Observatory. The current status also includes another 85 acres designated as Stellafane East or as Stellafane East and Far East by some, with two additional observatories and major facilities to enable the magnitude of the modern convention event. <coughs> Stellafane the event is the longest running astronomical convention in the world started by Russell Porter and the Springfield Telescope Makers in 1926. It is a two to three day weekend gathering, which today draws about a thousand amateur astronomers from all over the nation and the world to share their innovations, join in competitions, and enjoy the night sky. It is generally held over the weekend of the new moon closest to the Perseid meteor shower. Stellafane, the philosophy, can be summed up in this slide. As we shall see, the idea behind Stellafane from its beginning and continuing to <coughs> today has everything to do with making astronomy accessible to everyone and to encourage their hands-on participation. This concept, which originated with Stellafane, tapped the wellspring of interest in America in the 1920s which grew into the amateur astronomy movement that we know and love today. So who is this Russell Porter that I've been talking about? Russell Porter is accurately cited by Wikipedia as being the founder of amateur telescope making, but he was much more than this. He is perhaps most widely known for his wonderful drawings of Mount Palomar and the 200-inch Hale telescope there, most of which he created before the telescope was built, and which aided materially in the design of this epic instrument after Porter was hired by George Ellery Hale in 1928 to participate in this experiment. <coughs> Porter was known by many as the master of the cutaway drawing. And this drawing of the Tower Telescope at McMath Hulbert Observatory, which was done in 1936, is a good illustration of this talent in this arena. Uh, brought this, uh, this show, I've forgotten about our lighting situation. But, uh, Can I get you some lights? Some of you have seen this. I can hold it up here. This is a drawing of the uh, McMath Hulbert Observatory that was done by Porter in 1936. Again, we surmise it was done not from uh, out there looking at it and everything, but from engineering drawings and that sort of thing. I'll leave this up for you can take a look at it if you'd like to later. Maybe, maybe if you put it by the podium. Um, Pardon? Maybe if you put it by the podium. Yeah, that might be it. Yeah. There we go. Yeah, that works. That's blocking the view of the screen. Where's the Put it in front of the podium. We're right in front of the podium. Yeah, yeah the podium's kind of out of the house. There we go. That's good. 
again, this is a good illustration of this calendar area, and there's, there's dozens of these drawings of, of that Mount Palomar and Hale Observatory, or at the Hale Telescope. He was really a multi-talented Renaissance man who did it all. Educated as an architect with a degree from MIT, where he also taught architecture for a while, he spent many of his younger years as an Arctic explorer with nine Arctic expeditions between 1894 and 1905, with duties as an artist, celestial navigator, surveyor, timekeeper, and sometimes as an astronomer. As a spell, after a spell as an architect and builder, his interest in astronomy grew and he became interested and then passionate about the instruments used in astronomy. And he taught himself the art and craft of working glass to build telescopes with the encouragement and support from James Hartness, an industrialist who was later Vermont governor and his very good friend, who was also interested in astronomy. We'll hear more about Hartness later also. <clears throat> in 1920, Porter, who by now was working for Hartness as an optical instrument designer at his machine tool company in Springfield, Vermont, organized a group of 15 men and one woman who were interested in making their own reflecting telescopes. He actively shared with this group his knowledge of the grinding and polishing of the concave paraboloid surface for their mirrors from 4 inches to 10 inches in diameter, and instructed them on the critical light edge testing process and how to interpret its shadow diagrams to guide their work. All but one of this group finished their instruments, some of which are shown in this slide. Porter would take this group out for observing sessions at local locations to ponder the wonders of the sky and share ideas about telescopes, mounts, and the like. This experience led to several articles about the poor man's telescope published in 1921 and 1923 in the popular astronomy magazine, which described the activities of telescope makers of Springfield, Vermont. And again, I didn't realize there was a picture of Gary Ross here. <laughs> and in that very telescope that we looked at. <laughs> Which described the activities of the telescope makers of Springfield, Vermont, and their successful efforts to build telescopes with their own hands. The group, which had been meeting as an informal group, now decided to form a club. And on December 7, 1923, the first official meeting of the Springfield Telescope Makers was held with Porter elected as president, and the first order of business being the construction of their clubhouse, which had previously been started, on a 30-acre plot named Breezy Hill that Porter had donated. With Porter's experience as an architect and a builder, and with the active participation of the entire group, the main part of the clubhouse was finished in January 1924. At the January 30th meeting, 1924 meeting of the group, <coughs> Porter suggested the name Stellar Fame, Latin for Shrine to the Stars, be given to the clubhouse. This was soon contracted to Stella Fame. In March of 1925, Stella Fame received a visit from the editor of the very popular magazine of the day, Scientific American. Albert Ingalls, who had noted Porter's earlier articles in Popular Astronomy magazine, was there. Ingalls was impressed with the enthusiasm and creativity on display at Stellapane and proposed that he and Porter collaborate on an article on how amateurs could build reflective instruments. <coughs> this article, published in November 1925, provoked such an overwhelming response from around the country and indeed the world that subsequent articles were produced, with Porter being invited to become a corresponding editor. Ingalls articles with Porter's distinctive illustration sparked such a surprising response that in 1926 they published the first edition of the Amateur, uh, Amateur Telescope Maiden, the first comprehensive book on the subject. Stella Fane had become the center of a movement. By the summer of 1926, because of the widespread interest discovered by the Ingalls articles in Scientific American, 
the Springfield telescope makers decided to invite others <coughs> to Daisy Hill for a weekend dedicated to the exchange of ideas and experiences. Thus, on July 3rd, 1926, the very first telephone convention was held with 29 attendees, primarily from New England, but from as far away as Virginia. Since that first get-together in 1926, Stella Fane conventions have been held on a yearly basis, with a few exceptions during World War II and the Korean War. As I will detail later, the site and the facilities have grown along with the attendance, which now numbers about a thousand, from all over the nation and the world. Many notable personages from the astronomy field have participated, such as John Dobson, David Levy, Clyde Tombaugh, Walter Houston, Howie Gladden, Alan Bean, and others. Al Nagler of Teleview has been attending yearly since 1955 and says, quote, there is no place on earth that I would rather be than at Stella Fane, quote. In 1974, the Porter Harkness Museum of Amateur Telescope Making was established at the Harkness House in Springfield and is open for the convention. In 1977, Vermont placed Breezy Hill and Stella Fane on the National Registry of Historic Sites, and then in 1989, it was designated as a National Historic Landmark by the National Park Service. <clears throat> Enough of history. Let me now discuss the Stella Fane of the day. Stella Fane is the home of the Springfield Telescope Makers Incorporated a non-profit amateur astronomy club of about 125 members, which owns the site at, and the assets and sponsors the annual Stellafane Convention. It is located near Springfield, Vermont, close to the New Hampshire border, and it was a 750-mile trip for Tom Hagen and I driving through Canada, crossing back into <coughs> the state at Niagara Falls. The main <coughs> venue for the Stellafane Convention is about four miles southwest of Springfield, Vermont, at two closely located but not contiguous locations in the foothills of the Green Mountain Range. You can see in this slide the relationship of Stella Fane to Springfield. It's from here down to this area here. And then the, of the two Stella Fane sites to each other. The original 30 acres is here, and the 85 acres is here. Here's an area of view of the same thing. These two are about a quarter mile from one another. They run a shuttle bus between the two of them. The first site is the original 30 acres around Breezy Hill, which contains the paint clubhouse and the Porter Turret Telescope Observatory. This is the location of the telescope competition, which is one of the focal activities of the convention, as I will discuss later. The clubhouse with its very interesting exterior and interior design, again by Porter, included, includes several built-in telescopes, telescopes that are built into the architecture of the building. And it's open for inspection along with the turret telescope, which is a unique 12-inch F-17 modified Newtonian with a diagonal before the primary mirror. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later. The second site, of 40 acres called Stella Fane East was acquired in 1986 and then expanded to 85 acres in 1995 <coughs> to accommodate the expanding needs of the conference. It furnishes the required parking areas and is the prime living space for those attendees who stay on property for the conference, all of whom are campers. On it are located two additional and very interesting observatories. <coughs> The McGregor Observatory is a sliding roof design housing a 13-inch F-10 Super Schuppmann telescope, reputedly the world's largest, and more about that later. The domed observatory contains a 10-inch custom-built Ritchie Cretion telescope on a beautiful Springfield mount, which we'll talk a little bit more about later. Springfield East also has a 500-seat pavilion recently completed an outdoor amphitheater, and the Springfield Telescope Maker's Bunkhouse, which acts as a headquarters during the conference. The accommodations at Stella Fane East 
where the attendees involve a number of camping areas with portageon toilet facilities and water taps scattered around the spacious grounds. There was one, only one shower facility there in 2013 when Tom and I were there. There's plenty of parking areas that are available around the observing field and the campground. A large catered cafeteria-style food service facility was available during the convention. Some attendees prefer to stay at motels or hotels or the Hartman's House Inn, all of which are located in nearby Springfield. An additional Stella Fane, what I call auxiliary facility, which is not owned by the club, is the Hartness House Complex, located in the, in the town of Springfield. The Hartness House Inn has a hotel-style hotel accommodation and serves as the venue for the <coughs> Hartness House Conference, which I mentioned earlier. Adjoining the inn is an underground passageway in a complex of rooms that houses the Hartness Porter Museum of Amateur Telescope Making a fascinating collection of amateur telescopes and memorabilia from Porter and the Springfield Telescope Makers Collection. The passageway terminates at the Hartness Turret Telescope, a uniquely designed refractor built in 1910 with a 10-inch brochure objective and a comfortable interior eyepiece location. And we'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that too. Enough about Stella Fane the Plates. I'd now like to tell you about the event itself. The activities at the Stella Fane Convention consist of a myriad of happenings that occur both sequentially and concurrently and that are outlined in an information packet which contains a detailed program outline and schedule of events. <laughs> I'll discuss some of the things that Tom and I saw at the 2013 convention but it would be very difficult to participate fully in all events because of the volume of activities and the fact that often the activities are concurrent. <coughs> there are presentations throughout Friday and Saturday, <coughs> sometimes by notable personages on science, technology, and history and the like, all related to astronomy and the astronomical hobby. These presentations are mostly conducted at, are conducted at several venues, but mainly at the large Flanders Pavilion facility, which will accommodate about 500 people. Attendees are encouraged to participate also by giving their own presentation, and there is a procedure to accommodate this. It should be noted there are presentations and activities directed at various levels, from beginners to advanced, and even for kids and teens, of which there are quite a number there. During the convention, there are ongoing demonstrations regarding the arts, crafts, and technologies involved in mirror grinding and figuring, and then the basics of telescope construction, held in a large tent near the pavilion. These demonstrations involve carefully crafted storyboards and live demonstrations by the Springfield Club members of the various steps in building the tools, shaping and polishing the mirror blanks, testing procedures, you can even bring your own mirror to be tested by them, and the assembly of a basic telescope. The teachers, materials, and contents of these demonstration sessions are products of the Springfield Club's out out ongoing outreach efforts to spread the gospel about telescope making and are used throughout the year in classes conducted by the club and available to the public. Of special interest to us during our 2013 trip was this ongoing effort to shape a 27-inch mirror that was started by John Dobson at the 1997 Stellafane Convention. Volunteers are invited to spend a few minutes under the guidance of a master, provided that the master there is a guy with a, the uh, a waiter sign, <laughs> providing some grinding strokes to aid this effort. The eventual plan is to build a really big dog we were told that this still has years to go before completion. Obviously, no gathering of amateur astronomers would be complete without an observing aspect. Stella Fane is unique in that the attendees can not only take advantage of some very dark and clear skies with their own telescopes, but also have the opportunity to try out any of the club's four observatories, each of which has its own unusual character. 
First, we have the Porter Turret Telescope, which was designed by Porter and constructed in, in 1930 to allow the observer to remain <coughs> sheltered and comfortable on the coldest winter's nights. Its 12-inch primary mirror receives its photons from a 16-inch secondary mirror. This is the primary mirror. <coughs> the secondary mirror is right here. It's rotatable and it can be tipped to point it. And uh, it has a hole in the middle of it that, that uh, sends the photons through that mirror uh, and down to the uh, eyepiece. It is operated and, and open to attendees during night and day during the convention. When we were there, they were showing uh, projected images of the sun here. The second telescope available during the convention is a 13-inch F-10 Schuchman housed in the McGregor Observatory at Stella Payne East. This unusual compound telescope was designed and built from scratch by the club members in the early 90s and is the largest <coughs> Schuchman in the world. I never heard of the Schuchman before I was there. <coughs> It is mounted on a com computer-controlled, custom-designed and built Altaz mount. Also at Stella Payne East and available during the convention is a 10-inch Ritchie Credium mounted on a beautifully crafted brass Springfield mount. Again, another quarter design. This was built again by a Springfield club member and put into operation in 2006. This mounting arrangement yields a stationary eyepiece which along with its tilted pier allows full access to wheelchair users. As you can see, they can wheel their chair up there and this eyepiece is stationary. The final Stellafane unusual <coughs> observing experience available during the convention is the only one not built by the Springfield Telescope makers. It was in fact built by James Hartness close friend and benefactor to Russell Porter and a fellow amateur astronomer who built this, the very first turret telescope observatory in 1910, some 20 years before Porter's turret telescope. It is a 10-inch conventional achromatic refractor with an unusual mounting which again allows the observer to remain sheltered and comfortable. It was extensively renovated by the Springfield Club in the 1970s continues to be maintained and used during the convention. <clears throat> this telescope observatory is, as mentioned earlier, located at the Hartness House in Springfield. I should note that Hartness himself actually built this telescope and, and he was living in the Hartness House Inn and he had this tunnel that went from the house to the observatory so he could observe in the inclement weather that they have up there in Vermont. This shows Tom at the eyepiece of the <laughs> Finally, there are hundreds of personal telescopes of all sizes and shapes set up around the grounds in many locations, and amateur astronomers, being who we are, love to show off their stuff. All in all, there are lots of opportunities to look through telescopes at Stellar And now, moving on to the telescope competition, which is and has been for years one of the highlights and the heart and soul of the Stellar Convention. Broadly, anyone who has built a telescope or a related special gadget or restored a historical instrument is encouraged to enter it in the competition. Each telescope is required to be fully functional, optically and mechanically. And there are two sets of judging teams, one for optical performance and a second for mechanical design. Optical performance is divided into two size categories large, above 12 inches, and small, below 12. Mechanical competition is also divided into two categories. Mechanical design, or how functional and innovative and novel it is, and craftsmanship, how well it was executed. <laughs> there are also special awards for devices like sundials, observing aids, and the like, and a separate category for juniors. <coughs> As you can see from these examples, uh, pictures I took in 2013, innovation and imagination are prominent. Here are some interesting entries from past conventions gleaned from the Stella Fane website, which has a wonderful photo gallery of scopes from previous com competitions. Prominent is perhaps the granddaddy of innovative telescope thinking. 
from Russell Porter, who designed this garden telescope back in 1922. And actually had it put into a limited production. If you have one of them, by the way, now they're extremely uh, valuable. Over the years, several thousand examples of creativity like these have passed through Stella Bay. Here are a few more examples of ingenuity, imagination, craftsmanship, and art, and sometimes, and, but not always, combined into one package. Uh, I had suggest this was not, <laughs> not very much craftsmanship, but it was. <laughs> If you are, if, if, like John Blum down here, you are interested in astronomical gadgetry, Stellafane should be on your bucket list. Another activity of interest to many at Stellafane is the SWAT meet, which takes place on Saturday morning from 7 o'clock until noon. Unlike SWAT meets <coughs> and other gatherings of my experience, vendors and commercial products are not allowed at Stellafane's event. It is intended to give amateurs the opportunity to trade, buy, or sell their surplus astronomical equipment. <clears throat> With the large numbers of astronomical gadgeteers in attendance at Stellafane, there was a lot of pretty interesting stuff there in 2013, including that little old four-inch Bausch & Lohm Schmidt cast that I had to really resist buying. My wife thinks I have too many telescopes already. <laughs> The final significant activity and essentially the culmination of the Stellafane Convention is the Saturday evening program, which brings together almost all the attendees in one spot at one time in the late afternoon, early evening to participate in the finale, an award ceremony, the great prize raffle, and finally the keynote address by some noteworthy figure in the field. There are special awards given for notable contributions, the furthest traveler, the youngest attendee, and so on. And then the awards are given to the winners of the telescope competition. The raffle itself has been notable for many years because of the top prizes donated by Al Nagler of Stellaview, of Teleview, a Stellafane regular. In 2013, this amounted to four bags with sets of five Teleview eyepieces each, ranging in value from $1,500 to $2,850. There were numerous other prizes, and every attendee had a ticket and a chance to win. The keynote address in 2013 was our own brother Guy, who gave a great presentation on work he's doing called Comic Tales. This year's presenter, 2015 was Dr. Alan Stern, principal investigator for the New Horizons mission to Pluto, which happened just before that. It was very good timing on their part. Throughout the years, there have been astronauts, professional astronomers, and many other notables from astronomy and space-related fields. Now that I've tried to convince you that Stellafane should be on your prior priority list of things to do, you ask, how much? As you can see, the registration costs for this year are, work, are quite modest, and if you're into camping, the entire experience could be quite an inexpensive affair. If anyone is looking for further information on the Stellafane event, its history, or the like, I would highly recommend the website of the Springfield Telescope Makers, stellafane.org, which is very well organized and has a wealth of information, <coughs> not only on the place, the event, the club itself, but its history and archives. I mentioned earlier the trove of photos from the years of the telescope competition. But the website is probably also probably the finest resource that exists for the art, the science, and technology of amateur telescope making, <coughs> with lots of first-hand information and tutorials, and with links to every other element needed to pursue this activity. I'd now like to close my presentation with my customary musical finale with apologies to the Sound of Music fans in the audience. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. But uh, I would like you to sing along if you want. You'll recognize the, the melody. Gary, behave. Maybe I should leave the room. Behave, Gary. Okay. I'd like to thank Dick Gala for this little portable PA system.
<laughs> Somebody's guessing about the Miller Hay. <laughs> Sorry, the mirrors back and forth of those photos. Okay. 
They don't leave it out on the side. Here's been removed in the picture. Pardon? Here's been removed in that picture. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. It was removed. I took this when I took this. I noticed that last night going through this again. Okay, the mirror was not in place. In my photo gallery, if we've gotten to that, <laughs> it'll show the mirror is in place. They, they actually, because of weather and everything, they will, they will mount the optics uh, when they get ready to use it. Okay. And they had it operating during the day and evening yeah. when we were there. Oh, <laughs> um, other questions? Hey, Jim. Yes. How, do they, how do they keep those optics from doing up? Those mirrors are all exposed. Good question. <laughs> That's a good question. I don't know. They're you know, they're they're exposed. So good question. I, they did not, I'm quite sure they didn't have heating elements in them because uh, we would have noticed that. There wouldn't be any problem to put one right up there, right there. Keep it. You have to ask this time next time you have it. Other questions? Okay, let's do some more pictures. Then. Okay, let me give me. As you, as, as you guys know, I've, uh, PowerPoint has just been. Uh, well, there was one more question I got for me over the last few years, so it's been kind of interesting. And some of the tricks here. Oh, Jim, I had one more question about your partner. <laughs> <laughs> Of the clubhouse, which was built 
like an inside of a sailing ship, which Porter was very experienced with from his Arctic expedition. Again, Dirk Telescope. I have a picture here with the objects in place. I'm sorry, uh, can you go back? Um, sure. Was the turret actually, was the scaffolding removed from the turret in there? No, it's there. Is it sitting there on the ground deck? Oh, I see, it's over to the side. What's that sitting on the ground behind it? Uh, oh, is that just a tower? That's a tower. Okay. I think it's a I survey. The whole thing was coming apart. A survey marker tower. Uh, so this is that picture we talked about. Beautiful shot. Yeah. Thank you. Atmosphere. That's one of those things I didn't realize what I had until I looked at it afterwards. This is, again, at the, uh, the demonstration for uh, uh, grinding mirrors uh, the Springfield guys. You can see some of the storyboards around it. These are really well done uh, demonstrations they were doing there. And they put on these workshops uh, from time to time uh, in, in and around that area. Showing how to make the tools, how to use them, and so on. The Dobson's on there again. This is the pavilion, the inside of the pavilion. It's a Phil Harrington, so some of you might recognize as an author uh, in uh, uh, magazines and one that's got, what's the name of his book? Uh, oh, yeah. Famous book on. Yeah, he's just an author. Yeah. 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 His, his talk was on how to make your own observatory. This is another one from a. This is a guy talking about different kinds of materials to use for mirrors. This is Nagler himself. He was giving a talk, this talk about his experiences at past cellophane. This is a picture of a cellophane convention from the 50s or 60s. This is the library in the McGregor Observatory, which is another uh, place for some of the presentations. The eating, the eating area. This is the inside of the eating area. You can see it's temporary. This thing's only set up for three or four days. So. You get rain every year? I'm sorry? You get rain every year? <laughs> yeah. 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 These, are, these are several shots of, of the camping areas. The camping areas are scattered around the, around the Telemann East area. This is that... Uh, uh, the uh, Porter Mount again for, that can be used for, uh, for handicap. And this is kind of interesting lighting situation. They have LEDs behind a translucent panel that lines the uh, interior of the, the diagram of the Schubman. Schubman is interesting because it has mirrors, lenses, and mirror lenses. And this, this device here is a front, is a back surface mirror that has got a figure on it. So don't ask me much more about Schultman's, but uh, it is kind of an interesting design. And apparently, it's, it's, it's a, brief, a compound telescope that's designed to get rid of chromatic aberration, much like you can with an apochromatic apple, apple chromatic, uh, uh, refractor. Swap me in some shots around that. Is that little telescope that I really should have bought. <laughs> I mean, it, the guy only wanted like 70 bucks for it. Oh, 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 Rather rapidly, it's a big job. Right? Yeah, again, and this is all members of the club. So somebody bought a dog, and they threw away the rest of the dog, yeah. and they put it on a German equatorial mount. Yeah. No, somebody bought that. that can of coffee. Well, and, they yeah. it, and then they bought that Coke. <laughs> yeah, that that one just goes without saying. But but the but the other one is they took. They bought a $500 telescope and put half of it away. They could have just bought a two. <laughs> Here's a young man who built one of these magical <coughs> satellites, and mm -hmm. he was submitting it to NASA for the, there's a competition for launching. Mm -hmm. He was quite proud of it. Innovative uses of, of uh, bicycle wheels. <laughs> How many entries did they get all together? 
friend of the temple um, uh, convention, you know, that they have to be judged. How many entries for the... Oh, I, I, don't, I, I really don't well, know the answer. It's safer, but, I, but I'm yeah. guessing, you know, from when we were there, there, there had to be at least 50 scopes, maybe maybe 100. But probably, I guess it's more, more around the 50s. Oh, this is another use of a, of a bicycle spoke. I thought yeah. it was kind of interesting. And uh, another use of a bicycle spoke. Yeah, that's a good one. This is kind of where you can switch two eyepieces mm -hmm. mounted on the... This was a very interesting scope in that it was collapsible. Uh, on these next three or four pictures, show this guy. This is in its fully... Uh, uh, it had uh, carbon fiber rods <coughs> as a structure, and you uh, loosen up these guy wires here, and you could collapse one section, and then the other section, and finally fold it down into wow. a package like that, and then he was able to wheel it up into his station wagon. <laughs> this is a solar, uh, uh, I forget what they call this, a special kind of solar tube. So this is a nine-year-old young man that had built this all by himself. He was very proud of his dad was standing there. Dad swore he didn't do anything on it. But uh, the kid won a prize there. This is a projection of the sun while we were watching there. Another kind of unique scope. This guy was cooking marshmallows. This is a solar marshmallow cooker. You can see what a marshmallow is. Bowling ball used as a mount yeah, helmet. This young man here was quite proud of this scope because it was signed by John Dobson at an earlier Fame convention. <laughs> Just some of the other scopes. This is Nagler again. Tom, Tom Hagen there. We're getting ready for the evening program. The program is just filling up the amphitheater. And there's Brother Guy down there. And Brother Guy and Tom and I saying goodbye to the pink clubhouse. That's the end. Today they go for a measly seventy six thousand dollars <laughs> um, for reproduction. Right. So it's a beautiful. Yeah. It's, it's a beautiful, beautiful original work. <laughs> I, I have no idea what the original was worth. <laughs> I bet we could three D print one. Yeah. I bet well, we could. If you had an original one right now, uh -huh. it would be worth probably twice that. Yeah. <laughs> I think. It, I think at least. Yeah. But. I, it's a, just a six inch reflector. I, don't know. <laughs> I think they're four or six. Maybe four and a half. Between four and a half and six. I'm not sure. I, I'd wanted to get one for our garden when we bought a house, and then I looked at the price. Yeah. Any other, any other questions? Does it work? Yes. Oh, yeah, it works. Yeah. As long as you. When, when's the next elephant? It'll be next summer. The last one was just a few weeks ago, about a month ago, I think. It's July. Tell us now. August. Well, actually, early August. Percy, Percy, what, you really, Percy, what you really want to do, if you're, if you're interested at all, go to that, go to that website, stellafane.org, and it's a wonderful website. It's easy to navigate, and they've got a lot of information, and they'll, they'll probably have the date set for next year, and then must have any information you need. Plus, the archives, there, there must be several thousands of telescope pictures on there uh, from the competition's past, including, I just, I just kind of briefly went through and picked some off to put in my presentation, but there's some really weird looking ones. If you want to go next year, put Bob, everything. I've heard it's not actually there. really a very good spot for actual observing there because of light pollution. There's a prison now near there with lights and everything. So it's really they, more for the They have worked with the state about that prison, and they've got the prison to concede a lot of light on it. The, the light situation is pretty good there. The horizons are not wonderful, but the, the light is pretty good. But do people do a lot of observing there, or is it more just for... You know, yeah, they do. They, the club members suggest they do, but of course, as it was quite evident, there's a lot of people. 
there a lot more emphasis on building instrument life than, than we would be. Anyone else? Thanks this, again. This uh, observatory is uh, actually located right here in Lake Angeles. So if you'd like to know about it, Jim is a great person to talk to as well. And again, I, uh, I, I've been trying to, uh, uh, I, I almost went back there again this year to Stelfane, but I'd love to go back again maybe next year or something. If, a, if we get a group together, that would be a fun way to do something like that. Deal. All right. Thank you. Thank you.